Hey guys, okay, we are on records, 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 records with... Most important. Yeah, the state's going to Besides come medication. In. Yeah, they're going to see a lot of records. Okay, so 59A, 36, records. The facility must maintain um, required records in a manner that, that makes such records readily available at the licensee's physical address for review by a legally authorized entity. If records are maintained in an electronic format, Facility staff must be readily available to access the data and produce the requested information. For purposes of the section, readily available means the ability to immediately produce documents, records, or other such data, either in electronic or paper format upon request. So if the surveyor comes to your facility at midnight and you're home in bed sleeping, like we were, <laughs> make um, sure, that make sure staff... our staff was awesome and they knew where what to do showed them all the records and then the state was waiting for us at 9 a.m yeah it was great so um and i don't hear stories like that very often so it, oh you know. come on no i don't yeah i don't, I don't. I don't. other other people don't have the you know we were, it happens though yeah it does happen facility records the facility records must include the facility's license displayed in a conspicuous and public place within the facility we just had ours on a cork board right when you walked into the entryway with all our important forms that need yep. to be displayed. And the license is right there. They will check in on a survey. You'll have to have, like, the resident rights, and we'll, we'll right. go through that. Um, an up-to-date admission and discharge log lists in the names of all residents in each resident's date of admission, the facility or place for which the resident was admitted, a notation indicating that the resident was admitted with a stage 2 pressure sore if they have one, the date of discharge, reason for discharge, and identification of the facility or home address to which the resident was discharged. Readmission of a resident to the facility after discharging requires a new entry in the log. Discharge of a resident is not required if the facility is holding a bed for the resident who is out of the facility but intending to return. So that's that kind of case would look at if your resident goes to the hospital and they keep them in a rehab facility for three weeks, you don't technically have to discharge them. You can leave it open-ended until they come back. Yep. <clears throat> if the resident dies while in the care of the facility, the log must indicate the date of death. Right. Okay. Uh, a log listing the names of all temporary emergency placements and respite care residents, if not included on the log, described in paragraph B. So if you do take in respite, you need a separate log for respite and emergency placements. Uh, the facility emergency management plan with documentation of review and approval by the county emergency management agency uh, must be readily available by facility staff. And that will include the new uh, power plan as well. Don't, you know, I, I even think any family member can see it as well. So um, let's have a copy of the facility's liability insurance policy. The facilities that have a surety bond, you must have a copy of the surety bond that's currently in effect. And the admission package presented to the new or prospective residents minus the resident's contract. And if the facility advertises that it provides special care for persons with Alzheimer's disease or related disorders, a copy of all facility advertisements. Right. And then what? that's a cue to go check your for your Alzheimer's training. Training, right. <laughs> and, um, you know, remember you can't market yourself as something that you're not licensed for or have the proper training to do. Right. Um, a grievance procedure for receiving and responding to resident complaints and recommendations as described in 59A, 36. Mm -hmm. So all these things would be a part of the admissions, admissions package. package and you know. All food service records, um, including menus planned and served and county health department inspection reports. Facilities that contract for food services must include a copy of the contract for food services and the food service contractor's license or certificate to operate. You need to have all fire safety inspection reports issued by the local authority or the state fire marshal and issued within the last two years. These will all be kept in a facility folder. Right. So you have facility folders, individual resident folders. We have our admission discharge mm -hmm. logs separately. In the, in the yeah. facility folder, yeah. Right. And um, I think the more organized you can get up front, the better. I mean, it just makes your life so much easier because records and paperwork are just such a huge part of AUCA's inspections. 
rather than, you know, you'd think that they'd maybe be interacting with the residents in care. They really go through your records and make sure that everything's there. So good, solid records will save you a lot of headache yeah. in the long run. <laughs> Here's a pro tip. Their first thing they come in and they'll want to have a list of your uh, a list of your residents and possibly census, your employees yeah. as well. The resident census. So uh, if you have a digital, like to keep a spreadsheet and you just print it, you know, instead of your scrambling, wait, wait, is, is Mrs. Johnson still here? Or no, mm -hmm. it, the first thing they'll ask for is a resident census, which is a list of the residents by name. <clears throat> and um, We employees. got better, didn't we? We'd start yeah. out by writing everything down and yeah. hand them a piece of paper, and, and then um, you're already stressed when they're there to, you, to having these really nice records. Yep. It's, it just spend the time to do it. Yeah, and so when you get your sanitation inspection reports from the health department or from the fire marshal, Put them in your facility folder. I think you have to post your reports as well on the cork board. You do. You're and done. then, you know, one more pro tip, as you call it. Make sure after you have an inspection that they put everything back. So you've got to audit your records <clears throat> after ACA comes. Because we have had times where they've taken trainings, certificates, not intentionally, but that's a good way to lose things and any records get out of compliance. Yeah, and then so you get cited the next time for something that, that you, they took, yeah. You, you know, or, or it just got misplaced. misplaced. You're just throwing, here's this training, here's that, I need this, yeah, and then so things to make sure you go back in place. Yeah. Um, We're down at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, the bottom M. Uh, the survey. All completed survey inspections and complaint investigation reports and notices of sanctions and mortat moratoriums issued by the agency within the last five years. Now, your latest inspection report also needs to be on that cork board, as well as your fire inspection report. You don't have to have um, the menus. You're gonna have a, it's all in here. Right. <clears throat> the facility's resident elopement response policies and procedures. The facilities document resident elopement response drills. So they're gonna wanna see your uh, drill reports. Mm -hmm. And your policies regarding your elopements, what do you do? Are your staff trained on it? They'll come and ask your staff, do you do elopement drills? You know, can you tell me what you do? So the staff are going to have to know exactly what they're supposed to do in an elopement. And otherwise, they're not going to believe that you actually provided your staff with the pr proper training right. as required. For facilities licenses at limited mental health, extended congregate care, or limited nursing services, records are a little bit different and you can look them up in 59A-36.020 and um, 21 and 22, and which is listed that. there, yeah. right? And you can see what the difference is. They have more inspections and a little bit different nursing notes and stuff required. So make sure you're familiar with that. I think we cover that in the next section. Okay, okay. great. Number two, staff records. Okay. I would say this is probably the most cited thing. Mm -hmm. One of them records. besides... Employees, yeah. staff, yeah, and staff. Yeah, training, and, definitely. Know, records and training, yeah. Personal records for each staff member must contain at minimum a copy of the employment application with references um, furnished and documented, verifying freedom from signs or, or symptoms of communicable disease. In addition, records must contain the following as applicable. So before we go into that, so a copy of employment application. With, with references. references and documentation verifying freedom from signs or symptoms of communicable disease, which is separate from TB test. TB test. Right. So it's like a physical signed off by the healthcare provider. Documentation of compliance with all staff training and continuing education requirements, and we cover that staff training. They're going to look at all that. Copies of all licenses or certifications for all staff providing services that require licensing or certification. You want to take number three? Sure. Documentation of <coughs> compliance with level two background screening for all staff subject to the screening requires, requirements. Um, this is very important. Do not let anybody start working without a background screening. Yep. They will cross-reference. They will look. They will look at dates. And um, you just don't want to take that chance. And be sure to update your roster when you, when you log in to the background screening. I think we covered in another video. But when you log in, you have your roster of employees that have been screened. So if anybody leaves, you have a very short period of time, I think it's 10 days, to remove them from your list mm -hmm. so that ACA knows that they're not currently employed at a facility because if it goes beyond a certain, there's a break of employment. And if there's a break of employment, they have, they have a, they have a, 
they have documentation that there's a break of employment which would require them to trigger a new background screen. So that's part of um, documentation. So facilities with a license capacity of 17 or more, and remember I always say that 17 or more has different rules, so you may want to put on your study notes a <laughs> column that has 17 or more residents and less than and start putting things underneath it that you find that um, the rules are a little yeah, bit different. it's not too many, but it's definitely like... Right, um, so a copy of the... Staff, yeah. Copy of the job description given to each staff member. So each staff member has to have a job description, put it in their employee file, and remember 17 or more residents, there's different things for that. You must also have documentation verifying direct care staff and administrator participation in resident elopement drills. Yeah, so then once again, they, they're going to ask your staff, okay, what do you do? Have you been trained? What's your procedures? So your staff are going to have to be answered at least some basic Hopefully understanding they, of your yeah. policies and procedures and elopement drills and that they've, they've, they've done it. Right. The facility is not required to maintain personnel records for staff provided by a licensed staffing agency or staff employed by an entity contracting to provide direct care and direct or indirect services to residents and the facility. However, the facility must maintain a copy of the contract between the facility and the staffing agency or contractor as described. So um, you use a staffing agency or something like that for sick calls, right? Or you you have you're over you need to hire somebody temp uh, temporarily. You can use a staffing agency, but you got to have the contract. Okay. Right. So have the contract on file. And I like when we've used staffing agencies and they've come in. They they bring a little um, check sheet themselves with their information, any license numbers, the agency number the duties that they were hired to perform and stuff. And it's it's a nice little checklist, and I just keep that. I staple it to the back of my schedules. Yeah. And then that way, because you need to X out the employee that wasn't there and then put the staffing agency's employee name, and then I s staple their, I don't know what you time would call card. it. Kind of like a time card, you know, something they like a, a receipt. sheet. Yeah, it's, like a, it's almost like a receipt, and, and it's who they are and what their qualifications are, and that way there's no question of who was covering that shift and what, you know, services they provided. Yeah, because the state will come in, want to see your schedule. Right. And if, yeah. Okay. Um, the facility must maintain a written work schedule and staff timesheets for the most current six months as required by 59A. Um, that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. That'll be probably a question on there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The six month time, you got to keep these records for six months. You got to keep contracts for this long, mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, you will definitely need to make sure you're keeping work schedules and timesheets. So read through resident records, three all the way down. These are things that you don't have to memorize, um, you know, one through nine, just be familiar with what it is and what's That's on, on the a way. general admissions, um, like an, a resident face sheet or like an intake form. These are all general things, but you, when you have your form set, which we do if you if you have this if you have the consulting package and the forms package, but you just make sure that your intake form where you list all your residents' information has all of these things on it, right. and then that's covered. So you also have to have a copy of the resident <laughs> health assessment form. It's the ACA form eighteen twenty three. Um, this is something that's very important. You have to remember updated every three years or after a significant change. Uh, remember, there's timelines when you have to have that you know, prior to admission or after admission, and it's a form that you'll use throughout your career at your facility with your residents. Yeah, and you want to make sure you read those um, thoroughly, thoroughly and make sure they're yeah filled out properly too. Make sure that you know, everything's filled out properly and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and update on significant changes, which would include hospital visit or hospice, you know, weight loss something. or right. hospice intake, yeah. Uh, any orders for medications? So these are part of the resident records. Any orders for medications, nursing services, therapeutic guides, DNRO forms, or other services to be provided, supervised, or implemented by the facility that require a healthcare provider's order. So um, how you maintain these, you know, because every resident is going to have a million prescriptions, and you need copies of everything. Um, right. L a lot of test questions from there, but not actually in that thing, but just... Just know that, you know, yeah, you, need, you, have to, to have you need to have orders. Like the, Always documentation, yeah. you have to have in orders. Yeah. So you need to have a documentation of residents' refusal of the therapeutic diet. You have to have the resident care record. 
a wait record that's initiated upon admission. Information can be taken from the ACA 1823 form or the resident's health assessment. Residents receiving assistance with the activities of daily living must have weight recorded semi-annually. Which is basically everybody. (laughs) Basically everybody. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. We get in the habit of doing it monthly. It's easier just just to do. You should do it. so much easier. Yeah. And then you can always see if there's a change. So if they're losing five pounds, gaining 10 pounds, um, and then you can communicate that with a healthcare provider. Yeah. It's just best practice. But the rule is semi-annually, and that will be a test. Yeah, you can implement your own procedures for that um yep but definitely every six months okay for facilities that will have unlicensed staff assisting with res with resident uh with self-administration of medication a copy of the written informed consent um if such a consent is not included in the resident contract so basically um the the family member or the person who's you know, signing the contracts needs to fill out a form. It's called an informed consent that they understand. And there's this, I think ACA has a form. Right. Um, so it's either letting the the family and the resident know that a nurse will be assisting <clears throat> with medication will or, or will unlicensed not. personnel will. And you want that in your file. Yeah, to, to cover yourself. Yeah, too. because if something were to happen, you know, and, you know. They say, I thought a nurse was providing the services. But, and they sign it, so they, yeah. they, and it's an acknowledgement. Um, just definitely a good paperwork that you have, and it's required. And so. they'll look for it in each each file. Correct. Each file. They will. Okay, so um, for facilities that manage a pill organizer, assist with self-administration of medications or administer medications for a resident, copies of the required medication records maintained pursuant to 59A. So, of course, that's just all medication records. Right. You have to keep a copy of the resident's contract in the facility. Um, for facilities who owner, whose owner, administrator, staff, or representative thereof serves as an attorney, in fact, for the resident, a copy of the monthly written statement of any transaction made on the behalf of the resident is required. And you can find that information in 429. For any facility that maintains a separate trust fund to receive funds or other property belonging or due to a resident, a copy of the quarterly written statement of funds or other property distributed, and you can also find that section of 429, um, the disbursement. Probably only like one question, if so, yeah. on that. Yeah. Well. But just know, I would say, I would know court, quarterly written statement of funds. Yeah. And then. Highlight um, that. And. The separate, separate trust yeah. funds, you know. You need a monthly written statement of any transaction made on behalf of the resident. So a monthly statement and then a quarterly written, written statement, statement of funds or a personal property right. dispersed. If a resident is an OSS recipient, um, which is called the Optional State Supplemental Program, a copy of the DCF form, Alternate Care Certification, um, must be in their file. Okay. I would say not really too many questions They're not ask from questions this. On OSS. No, so look down and read through this next section here. Yeah, Go most people aren't on. even on the OSS program anymore. No, yeah. So, They're but just there. be familiar with it. It's not anything foreign. And no. Go ahead. Yeah. And, but if you do have somebody in your facility under OSS, then you need you, you, know, right. you need that alternate care certification. Right. And it also requires, um, so look at N, which is really important. So for hospice patients, and this is the most important thing with hospice, and highlight this, the interdisciplinary care plan. Yeah. That is documentation from hospice. It's an agreement between the facility and hospice, and it's telling what services hospice will provide and what the facility will provide. So if hospice is going to have a nurse come once a week, it will say that. If they're going to have a CNA do the bathing five times a week, it'll say that. And that is just hands down. They always look. They always ask who's do on you have hospice. Do residents on hospice or do any and of your where's home the and then just an interdisciplinary care plan? Yeah, um, and that I, way I think the I mean that way nobody can say well I thought hosp- I thought hospice was doing it well I thought the facility right. was doing it. You all agree that these are the services you're providing. And then the administrator and the doctor, or uh, I can't remember. But it's well, not, everybody signs off on yeah, it. Yeah, both parties have to sign off on it. And right. It'll be, and then it may need to be updated. 
as right. services are changed or offered. No, and they do. And they will yeah. update it. But this is something you need to go over with your staff, too, and um, make sure that they're reading and understanding what who's providing what. Yeah, and, and um, when hospice services come to you and they're like, hey, we're great, we're a great hospice service, you need to under- they need to understand and you make sure, it's your responsibility to make sure that they have the appropriate form. Because we, we kept running, we, we had um, a hospice service and they had two different teams. They had a home team and then they had a facility team. And just because of where we were located, they grouped us in with the home team. And the home team didn't really understand the requirements and the forms that were required. So, um, it was a battle. Yeah. So Aka came in and they were like, Hey, this is the form you need. And they actually gave us a picture of the form that we needed. And we had to take it to hospice and we're like, this is the form we need. And they, yeah, they didn't, they argued with us. So when people are coming to you wanting to provide services, make sure that they understand your requirements for documentation as well. So you also need the residence D and R order. And for independent residents living who receive meals and occupied beds included within the licensed capacity of an assisted living facility, but are not receiving any personal, limited nursing, or ascetic ECC care services, record keeping may be limited to the following at the discretion of the facility. So go ahead and look at one through five. Wait, I, you missed one. I just want to go back to it. <clears throat> Documentation of the appointment of a healthcare surrogate, healthcare proxy, guardian, or the existence of a power oh, of attorney. Yes. So, yeah. Make we kept sure. that in our contract. Yeah. We? Our mission um, package. Well, we gave them, if they didn't have a healthcare surrogate or a, pro- the thing is, if you need to have a copy of their power of attorney, healthcare surrogate, because sometimes the hospital will call you as well and say, I need your, the advanced directives. I need this. And you need to be able to get it to them. Sometimes the families don't have it, but you need to have documentation of that as well. And make sure that you, sometimes you'll give it to the paramedics or you'll give something. Make sure you keep a copy for yourself. Don't. Just give them your only copy, okay? Right. Um, So except for resident contracts, which may be retained, must be retained for five years. Test question right there. All resident records must be retained for two years, following the departure of resident from the facility unless it's required by contract to retain records for a longer period of time. So remember, contracts are five years. All other records are two years. Upon request, residents must provide a copy for their records upon departure from the facility. So you can also provide them with a copy if they request that. So highlight five and two years. Additional record resident records requirements for facilities holding a limited mental health, ECC, or LNS license are provided in 59A, which is listed right there in you know, 2021 and 22. So we can look that up. There's a little bit different. Record inspection. Um, the resident records must be available to the resident. Did you read that part? No. Okay. Residents, legal representative, designee, surrogate, guardian, attorney, in fact, or case manager, or the resident's estate and such additional parties as authorized in writing or by law. So they get, they get copies of everything. Can't, uh, and then pursuant to 429.35, agency reports that pertain to any agency survey inspection monitoring visit must be available to the resident and to the public in facilities that are co-located with a licensed nursing home the inspection or record for all uh, for all common areas in the nursing home organization yeah. is key when it yeah, comes that, to records. that part right there was just saying you need to, you need to just post it on the board it's available right. to the public right right so when it comes to records organization is key if you start with one resident and you get it organized and get it right as you grow you're never going to have this problem. Yeah, checklists. Checklists, yeah. you know, binders, scan things into the cloud. I mean, there's yeah. just several ways to stay organized. Okay, thanks.